Good evening. You're watching or listening to Redwood Wonk. I'm with David Frank. My name is Eric Kirk. Uh, we are discussing national political news of the day, and perhaps the most timely is uh, about, well, we'll you start within 14 minutes of the beginning of this recording. Uh, it is, of course, the long-awaited first Republican uh, primary debate. There are eight candidates who have qualified. Um, I'm not sure if um, Donald Trump qualified, but he's not attending. I think he probably didn't qualify because I, I believe he refused to um, <clears throat> to pledge to support the Republican nominee, no matter who it is, or no matter what prison sentence they're facing or whatever. Um, and that was you know, you know, a pledge that was put in there to benefit him. But uh, just like in 2016, he wouldn't pledge that. Um, he won't pledge it this time around. But he has opted out. Um, the, the reasons, uh, there are a lot of theoretical reasons. One is that his attorneys are afraid he's going to say something to mess up his case. Uh, the other is that he's afraid of Chris, Chris Christie. Um, and, uh, and the other is simply that, hey, he's got such a big lead. He's got nothing to lose here. Um, why do anything to jeopardize that lead at this point? Uh, although it seems a little early to be that cocky. But, um, you know, those, those are... Are the issues the debate um, is uh, the eight um, people I'll I will provide in a minute, um, but the um, but the people who qualified, um, but they do include Mike Pence, Chris Christie, um, the uh, Ramaswamy. Did I get that name right? Close. Okay, um, and uh, Nikki Haley, and uh, we'll, we'll name the four others as, as we go along, but um, I, I think if you didn't make it into this debate, your fundraising is probably dead, um, unless, of course, you're Donald Trump. So um, Donald Trump, meanwhile, is simultaneously being interviewed, I believe, by Tucker Carlson. Um, but he is doing another interview um, saying that this, you know debates are a waste of time. Uh, he has skipped dates, debates before. He skipped the second debate with uh, with Joe Biden in um, 2020, and it cost him a few poll points. It's believed uh, because his polls did tank a little bit after that. Although his reasoning was that they were going to put a cutoff button so that he couldn't interrupt um, at that time. So if he's not interrupting uh, and can't control the situation, he probably doesn't want to partake. Um, but I, but the, the debates tonight, I, what they're going to talk about um, is, you know, we're probably pretty clear. They're going to talk about, you know, woke America, um, the uh, Hunter Biden. And um, but I'm curious to see uh, what will happen about the Ukraine war. What will they discuss uh, in terms of the Ukraine war? Dave? Yeah, I think that's really interesting. Um, I'll come. I'll circle back to that because I do think that's going to be one of the key elements. The the where the folks, uh, you know, the participants, where the dividing line comes in how they're going to frame their support of the war, uh, given given the you know Republican Party's uh, base likes to hear that there's that there's going to be a lot of scrutiny. Um, about that funding and the longevity of that funding versus sort of the establishment and the elected folks and kind of the 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 party the life lifers uh, in in the government federal government system um, who who of course uh, are we have a national for the most part a unified national perspective on on the, the support for Ukraine and the war because it's against Russia and because of the nature of the aggression and the international system etc so so we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute but I just want to get back to um, the three people that claim that they qualified but that didn't um, Perry Johnson Francis Suarez and R Will Hurd um, so um, the mayor I don't even know who Perry Johnson is I, I'm sorry for not remembering that one um, but but Francis Suarez is the mayor of uh, Miami and Will Hurd is a, a former CIA uh, employee or M American intelligence employee who uh, is from Texas who uh, I, I believe he was a Congress – he was a representative in Congress for a while. But the, for the three of them, the issue was they didn't meet the threshold in polls. So just for people, uh, maybe if they missed it, the requirements are 40,000 unique donors with 200 from 20 or more states, 1% in three national polls or more or 1% or more in two national polls and two early voting states and the loyalty pledge. So 
like you said, technically Donald Trump didn't qualify because of the loyalty pledge. So uh, my, my prediction from last week, I guess I should have qualified it a little bit. I thought that if Trump wanted to participate in any of the of the debates, he could come to an arrangement with the RNC because they were the, the you know, they're begging him to the bitter end. And Fox was, too, actually, to try to get him to participate. There you go. Thank you to our producer, Perry Lawrence Johnson, American businessman, author. Um, yeah. OK, so I just I just didn't realize that's who that was. Um, but uh the um, the situation is that uh, you know, like I said, tr because Trump well, actually because of what you said, Trump didn't want to participate, so that therefore the, there was no conversation. Um, like he he uh, he doesn't see the the benefit in it. Um, plus his uh, beef with Fox and also Tucker Carlson's sort of beef with Fox as an ex employee, they really like the idea to kind of stick it to him. And so pretty much as we speak, they're about to go live on. Um, while we're recording this, that is, uh, they're about to go. They're about to play, release the interview that Tucker had with Trump on um, Tucker Carlson's uh, Twitter page, which is now X. So it's like this alliance that they have going to try to kind of be an alternative media lane and anything to kind of reduce the ratings uh, of Fox. Um, they're going to do. They're starting at five minutes before the debate actually starts. Um, and I know that's a little bit of left field, but it just shows you the idea that Trump really does consider himself kind of above the fray here that's um, right and, yeah. and with his polls having him like for as much as 40 points ahead um you know maybe he has a point yeah and, and plus he's about to go get arraigned tomorrow so tomorrow yeah. is he's going to get the, the full stage himself i think his exact quote is hey everybody knows who i am everybody knows where i stand i've got no reason to be there um but if he thought he could, if he thought he needed exposure or would benefit from it, he would be in that basking in the limelight. He would figure out a way to do it. Um, so if you don't mind real quick, Eric, I want to just mention that one of the things that I saw was not just, you know, from the, from the debate tonight, right? We're trying to figure out what to expect. We know vaguely who the leaders are. Trump be having a significant lead ahead of DeSantis um, and, and uh, Tim Scott, Nikki Haley, Mike Pence, Chris Christie. Vivek Ramaswamy, Doug Burgum. Um, so, so the question is like, you know, one of the things that I saw was, what do they really have to gain? And the thing is that when you poll people and you ask them who their second choices are and who are they actively considering, we could get into the numbers. We can go through people individually, but just generally speaking, I'll just give you the top three as an example. When you add up thinking who you're going to vote for, who your second choice, and who you're actively considering, that, that that that's the order I gave you. Trump, DeSantis, Tim Scott, and they're very tight. 63, 61, 53 percent. Um, mm -hmm. so, and then there's a kind of a drop off. Uh, Nikki Haley, Mike Pence, Chris Christie. So outside of that, um, we do have this rising star, Vivek Ramaswamy. And yes. so we could we could talk a little bit about each of them. I'm not sure how you want to uh, go, yeah, go we, through it. We can do that um, you know, with the time. I mean, I you know, I don't. I I will have a prediction at the end of the show about the debate, and uh, I am not even cheating. Um, but um, the uh, but yeah, why, why don't we start with the person who up until now has been presumed to be the primary challenger, Ron DeSantis? But he won't attack Trump. Uh, he sort of does, and then backs off. But he, but they don't want to alienate the MAGA crowd, I guess. Uh, but Ron DeSantis, his campaign is in free fall. At one point, he was actually head of. Uh, Trump in polls, and but as as American even Republicans have gotten to know him, they're not fine, they're not impressed with him. Why they're impressed with him so much in Florida that he wins elections by almost twenty points, um, but is not faring well within the Republican Party. Um, you know, I mean, yes, okay, he's up against Trump, but um, but he's not doing well in terms of favorability or anything. And maybe that's because Trump keeps attacking him. I don't know. But what are your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I think with him, like, so I've called him before uh, out as kind of being so uh, aligned with his anti-woke uh, crusade that it takes away from um, some of the you know supposed accolades that he could be getting for 
opening up Florida early. Now, granted, there was a higher death rate in Florida, but people yeah. in his state and people around the country, conservatives, Republicans, they like the fact that he pushed back against, you know, the national government's guidelines and, and uh, you know, uh, mask mandates and and uh, vaccine uh, mandates and uh, all the all the big government stuff that he pushed back on. That that could be a lane for him to just say, like, I did sure. what I thought was best. I represented the people in Florida. But instead, he seems to have gotten stuck in this rut where he's either he's talking about it constantly or the consequences of his actions are boomeranging back into the mainstream limelight about their you know the negative impact that he had um so um he said out loud that he his people you know in a memo rather said that uh they and it's public that uh you know he knows he's going to be the center of the attacks and that um, mm -hmm. he's fully prepared to be on the losing uh end of false desperate charges from other candidates and legacy media but in fact some of these things are going to be about um you know maybe valid criticisms so for example um his florida policy surrounding uh controversial education rules on gender inclusion and black history targeting private employers for their diversity initiatives most notably disney um so those are things that actually they might be hitting him they might actually stick they might actually cause yeah but is that affecting him in the republican party I mean, yeah, I mean, maybe independents and and the rest of the country are appalled by you know seeing the empty bookshelves in the school libraries and the rest. But is it really hitting them within the? Is that really a problem for them in the Republican Party? So theoretically, no. But I think the biggest problem that he has, and I and I wish it wasn't a, a, a surface level problem, but um, his his most of his negative te of attention. Negative attention comes from his personality and his lack of yeah. likability. He's not the guy you want to get a beer with. He, he, you know, people have, have sort of said, and again, it, I know it's surface level and uh, trite, but but he like bobs his head and he talks down to people in a condescending way. He really does. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But like there was one press conference he made where he had students, and this was closer to the you know the time that the pandemic, and some students were wearing masks, and he started barking at them, "Take those masks off!" And you know you don't do that. I mean, you just say you maybe crack a joke and say you know oh you know wearing those masks, you know well I I've got to talk to you you know about what the real science is or whatever you know something like that. But instead he was like yelling at him, take the mask off, and some yeah. of them refused to do that, and so he had to back down, said oh whatever you know. I mean that was just one instance that uh, he's just not yeah he's not likable. He, he's also not to beat a dead horse here, but he's on tape. I, I saw a video where there was a kid who like had an ice cream cone or something and he was talking to them and and, and then he started like fixating on the sugar and the the, the health implications of the, the snack the kid had. And of then one ice you know, cream cone. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, All right, yeah. we should we should probably move on uh, to another candidate because we are going to run out of time. Um, so, so, Eric, uh, before you before you do, I'll just mention this. Um, part of what's DeSantis is negative is in relation to these other folks, because yeah. because the tradition at the presidential level and in, in president, you know, uh, Republican politics is Ronald Reagan. You know, the it's morning again in America. Yeah. These are the things we aspire to, like keeping a positive message. So, he's so, not doing it. And also the Captain he have approach to um, to Disney is probably not helping him either with the business community. But, but let's move on to another candidate. How about Tim Scott? He seems like he should be uh, the one to be, um, you know, the the candidate he's probably one of the more mainstream people he's not an a never trumper like some of the other candidates um and um but he does have a, an issue that could be a problem for him in the republican party and that he's black and that might there might be five to ten percent of the votes that he just can't get and maybe people sense that um i don't know so you must have read my mind because that's exactly the the comparison that I was wanted to make here. Um, uh, these are the two. I think these are the two like uh, main players tonight to look for because DeSantis is so bad in the you know the handshaking and the Iowa Fair type. Uh, you know, relationships and engagements. Tim Scott, on the other hand, that's his claim to fame. That's his bread and butter. He is a very Reagan-esque uh, in his in his uh, speak speech yeah. and in how he engages with people. Um, and and it's you know, arguably, it's empty, mostly empty or worse. Um, 
and that his experience as a senator, you know, only somewhat gives him the uh, experience that he needs to be president um, at, at best. Um, but but the truth is, he's a very likable person, and that that goes a long way. Those numbers I quoted earlier: Trump, sixty three percent when you factor in all those people. Sure. DeSantis, sixty one. Tim Scott, fifty three. So he's right up in there. I, the, the candidate that I think would be the most likely to defeat Biden is way down in the polls, but he did qualify, and it's Asa Hutchinson, uh, probably one of the most moderate people, one of the most professional in the rest, but he is is attacking Trump. Uh, he he d believes that you know, Trump should not even be a candidate, and that means that uh, MAGA people may not turn out for him, and that may be why he's not getting m much of the mainstream uh, support, uh, Republican support, because they just th think he's going to alienate too much of their base. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think it's early, um, still very early. Someone like Ace Hutchinson maybe could make, turn it around, but he's down there in the bottom um, with like Chris Christie and 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 uh, you know Doug Wareham. Um, in terms of the people aren't even considering him at all. Yeah. In, in part, it's because he is one of those folks like Chris Christie who is going after Trump and and you know yeah. publicly making the case for people. And Doug Burgum too. D Doug Burgum, who's North Dakota governor, he's also going after Trump. Those are yeah. the three. But they're and they're losing a third. Course. All all three of those people we just mentioned are losing a third of the party right off the bat, and that's keeping them down at like a one in five or one in four. Uh, chance here basically currently but but what you know one i know we have a limited time here the two big ones we didn't mention are two ones that are mentioned the most in uh mainstream sort of left-leaning media vivek ramaswamy and and chris yeah. christie uh, i think chris christie's the easy one because we can kind of lump him in with the others where hey look you're going against trump you've got an uphill battle i think he's going to stick it out and i think he's going to keep swinging the whole time because that's his self-appointed role but he's um, a but trumper He's a Trumper. That's, you know, so what does he have? How He's got to somehow distinguish himself and say, I'm OK, I like Trump, but I'm better, a better. And he hasn't really even argued that yet. We'll see for today. But the Ramaswamy factor, I think, is one where he's really experienced in this format. And uh, this will be the chance to, for him to introduce himself to, to the country. And we'll see if his forward momentum will continue after today, because right now he's down in like the four percent range. All right, we're going to have to end it there. We didn't really get into Mike Pence, who I think doesn't have a chance, and uh, Nikki Haley, who, uh, you know, again, uh, Nikki Haley is one of those candidates who probably really challenged um, Biden, but will not win. Um, and Mike Pence, I mean, he's just too much of a traitor. Uh, he's going to be a prime witness against Trump. So um, we'll have to move on and we'll come back to that. I'm sure, uh, it we'll be talking about debates in the future. Yeah. Good evening. Today, an indictment was unsealed, charging Donald J. Trump with conspiring to defraud the United States, conspiring to disenfranchise voters, and conspiring and attempting to obstruct an official proceeding. The indictment was issued by a grand jury of citizens here in the District of Columbia, and it sets forth the crimes charged in detail. I encourage everyone to read it in full. The attack on our nation's capital on January 6, 2021, was an unprecedented assault on the seat of American democracy. As described in the indictment, it was fueled by lies. Lies by the defendant targeted at obstructing a bedrock function of the U.S. government, the nation's process of collecting, counting, and certifying the results of the presidential election. All right, that brings us to the other news of the day, or some of the other news of the day. The arrests, um, people, the, the defendants in the Georgia um, uh, indictment uh, are turning themselves in. About half of them, I think, have already done so. The Eastman mug uh, has been uh, all around the internet, um, uh, you know, with a certain amount of schadenfreude coming from people who don't like him. Um, and uh, Trump is scheduled to come in tomorrow. Um, but they are not going to exempt him from mugshots. Donald Trump has been able to avoid mugshots in the federal cases, but he's not going to be able to avoid uh, them this time around. So I'll be real curious to see what it looks like. And of course, it's going to be go all around the Internet. It'll probably be one of the most uh, looked at photos in a long time. Um, a few updates. Uh, the judge has shut down uh, Trump's, at least thus far, attempt to delay 
um, the the um, the the election is not going to wait until after the 2020 election. Um, they're they're not going to um, allow that to happen. I mean, a, a lot um, going on, uh, but um, but and there's some other news too. But I'm gonna let you jump in about the arrests. Yeah, so I think um, it's pretty interesting that those core set of folks like Rudy Giuliani flew down there and uh, because he wanted to negotiate his own bond. But, you know, um, some of the others are also prominently making those uh, uh, having those conversations with with the DA and their team about the terms of their of their uh, release. Um, it's it's really interesting to see that um, one of the elements that I think is in, you know most interesting. Mark Meadows and Jeffrey Clark were trying to, as you said, get their case moved to federal court. I think it's interesting to hear like what what they the reasoning why, um, because there's you know from their perspective. Me, you know, you and I might have talked about this in a in a prior uh, uh, episode here. Um, but they actually petitioned for an injunction to or temporary stay against being arrested at all by the deadline of this mm -hmm. Friday. They're saying, hey, because of my special status as a federal staff member, I, I the state shouldn't even deal with this. Like state, you, you, you state goes on ice while I move things to a, a federal court. Now, why they would want to do that, I think, is because it's a more favorable venue, a more favorable jury. Um, and they were also potentially going to petition for a dismissal under the claim that they were doing their job in a federal capacity. Um, right. So, so, but the, but the reality of it is that the judge um, did say that there, you know, uh, U.S. District Court Judge, federal judge Steve Jones said there's no basis for interrupting the state trial process. So I, I wasn't aware of that nuance of law before the, um, that that came out. But the reality is that the state is going to keep going. The arrest is going to happen. The jurisdiction of that state judge and the jurisdiction, you know, of the, you know, being in the line of fire of the Georgia DA, that that's a dangerous place to be for people like Mark Meadows, Jeffrey Clark, Rudy Giuliani, um, and, and some of the others. Let me just go through Sidney Powell, John Eastman, Kenneth Ch Chesbrough. Those folks, they, they weren't on the ground Georgia people who sort of naturally fit in the Georgia model. They were people who were involved in that nationwide effort to what the uh, the claim, the alleged allegation, you know, alleged uh, crimes that they are involved in under the RICO statute. They did these things, f you know, from a federal perch and it, they did it in more than one place. So um, they, their liability is immense here. And I think I think Meadows and Clark were trying to trying to do damage control. But but Georgia has them in their grips now. And the reason that I think that's important, the reason I sort of belabored this a little bit is because that means that um, we're going to see more people potentially um, at the Georgia level uh, making their own arrangements, making their own pleas, their own their own yes. agreements. Um, and, and they're just going to say, hey, you guys already know I've seen, we've all seen the evidence. You guys know what happened at at the Tr you know Trump headquarters. We're just the Georgia part. We just we just took the marching orders. We did the marching like my client X, Y, Z. I think they're going to see a lot of that um, on the people, for example, that broke into the voting machines that, you know, the 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 players at the Georgia Republican uh, uh, you know, party, Georgia's Republican Party personnel who were involved in this uh, and, the, and the people on the ground. I think that's where we're going to see the momentum first, where people start to testify against each other. I, I think so, too. I mean, there's already in, uh, you know, breaking news or maybe I think it was yesterday um, that a one of the anonymous, um, not defendants, but co-conspirators in the classified documents case is actually going to be testifying against uh, Trump says that he basically um, validating the claims of obstruction in there. And that is the the grounds manager or, or something. I can't remember exactly what, what it is, but it's already already starting to happen. People don't want to get dragged into this. He's already spent something like $50 million um, in in uh, fees, or at least been billed. Who knows what he's actually paying? But um, I imagine any firm that's worked with him that's serious has asked for a big retainer, but you blow through retainers pretty quickly. Um, and, um, and and a lot is being done already. So, but yeah, the, the, I think you've got 19 co-conspirators here um, and 
I, I imagine some of them will start talking. I don't know that the fake electors uh, have anything to offer because there were 16 of them and only three three of them have been charged. That means most of the other 13 are probably going to be um, witnesses and they probably want to have a few of them in there um, just you know for the trial because that is a key part of the conspiracy. So they, they may be out of luck. Uh, but some of the others, um, you know, it's hard to say um, what kind of deals they're making. I will say that over the weekend, I finally had a chance to really read through the complaint. And there is, a, I believe, a very strong court case that if they could prove those facts, there's also a lot of fluff in it. Um, the, a lot of stuff that's really not directly related, but I think they put in there because they know that Trump is going to be on a PR campaign, you know, violate all the orders about not talking about certain things. And they want, they have this in there so that the media discusses these things and, um, and, and doesn't, um, and, and so the jury pool isn't poisoned by Trump too much. Um, but it's fluff as a matter of no, I think I think that makes sense um, about like w well, like you said, when you read through, I think it was like 160 acts in the in the uh, the indictment. And, and it's not all criminal. There's a narrative component of it. But I think that it's a story that weaves together all the people uh, tells us, you know, fra paints the picture that it is a, a uh, you know, a confederacy of dunces, so to speak, where it's a bunch of people out there doing this extra legal uh, dance. Um, so. Right. I know. I know two, two things. Um, I know it's a little bit out of turn here to say, to say this, but but going back to to our last segment, the 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 Republican primary, the impact of this trial on on or yeah. these trials period on our on on the on the debates and the leadership and the future direction of the Republican Party. I did see something written, and I don't recall the venue, um, but basically it was saying when you when you shine the light on this. RICO statue. When you shine the light on these charges, on this conspiracy, uh, and all of its constituent components, and you and you make the claim that that's criminal, and it's not, because um, you know the conservatives are calling it the uh, p uh, criminalization of politics or or politicization of the Justice Department. This isn't the Justice Department, but they're they're still trying to you know, politicization of justice. What they're saying about the voters uh, is that these people, you're, they feel attacked, that, that mm -hmm. their, their beliefs are being called criminal. Their, their understanding of the way things work are being called yeah. like ignorant. So they're being right. called like ignorant and, 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 and sort of in alignment with some criminal conspiracy. So the reason I mentioned this is because it comes down to person by person. And you mentioned um, UCL T T Tavalaris, who is in that in the Florida case. Yes. Um, he's the IT director at Mar-a-Lago. Mar and there's a, there's a whole story about how Nauta, who's Trump's valet, and and goes to um, D. Oliveira, who's the property manager, and they try to bring in Tavares, Tavares to to basically hide. The you know d delete or defeat the the v surveillance tapes or you know so that they can move documents. Well, when sitting down with federal prosecutors to look at the film that was not hidden or deleted, but actually showing them moving the documents, all the way up until very recently, all three of those folks had Trump lawyers, Trump paid for lawyers, paid for by the super PAC Save America. So it was pretty easy to stick to the story in a in a sort of a Rico mafia you know uh, sense that um if we're all on the same page and we all swear to it we all go down together don't worry i got your back i'm paying for your lawyer but as soon as um tavalaris said that hey i don't want this trump lawyer i want to i want to recant my testimony i want to tell the truth i need a new lawyer though that was facilitated and now it's a now it's a smoking gun in a sense that they have the video of the stuff being moved, and he's saying that um, the property manager told me that the boss wants us to do X, Y, and Z. So that brings Trump from this peripheral figure at the edge of these trials to the core, to to the to the yeah. you know it connects the core and the periphery in a way that sometimes gets confused. But to see um, uh, and what's her name, um, Cassidy Hutchinson. She's Mark. She was Mark Meadows, you know, chief of staff, and he was Trump's chief of staff. And and what she's saying, or you know, she was on his Mark Meadows staff. I forgot her exact title, but she's one of those people who went through this same scenario. She had a Trump lawyer, and she she realized, hey, if I just get my own lawyer, I'm going to be a lot better off. And so instead of 
fabricating the narrative or being part of a fabricated narrative. She just spoke the truth. And to a certain extent, I think that's – we're going to see these ripples, and the reason I'm belaboring this, and I'm really sorry, Eric, um, is just because that way more people watching, if they're paying attention, if they're willing to watch it, sure. people will start to get a different – you know, a different picture will be painted. Yeah, this is why the Republican candidates are having are, – are in a bind because – even for them just to say, I'm going to let the uh, the the legal justice system's course play out, that's considered anti-Trump. Just even suggesting that there's any validity whatsoever to these things, so, uh, other than you know weaponization of the DOJ, they're in a bind where if they want to be a viable candidate, um, that uh, they they can't simply say, oh, let's let the criminal justice. They've got to take a stand that these prosecutions are politically motivated and. The bind that they're in is that, um, you know, maybe they'll have a chance at winning the um, nomination should Trump um, get, you know, end up going down in flames because of the prosecutions happening during the primary. And maybe dark one of them can be a dark horse at the convention or whatever, as it, as it becomes very obvious that Trump can't be president. If they one of these candidates ends up being the candidate in the general, their equivocation and their weakness in this is Biden's team is going to hammer on it. I mean, you'll, you'll be seeing videos of it. Where were you then? Why didn't you say, you know, that uh, the that this was a matter for the criminal and not a matter for politics? You you said weaponization, and they're they're going to have a hard time with that. The only candidates who aren't are the three that we mentioned, and Chris Christie isn't even there to win. He's there to take Trump down, right? That's his whole point. He doesn't really worry. He only worries about the poll numbers, so he qualifies for the debates. And now he's going to be calling Trump a chicken for the next, um, you know, ones because you know one of the theories is that he's afraid that Chris Christie will do to him what Chris Christie did to Rubio in 2016, pretty much ended his campaign, uh, with help from Rubio, of course. But, you know, that, it's just um, um, so so they, they, they've got this bind that this is happening. The criminal prosecutions are happening. They're not going to be dismissed. I don't think Judge Cannon is going to be on that case in Florida very long. Her, you know, she she can't help herself. Her bias is 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 obvious, and I think the Fifth Circuit down there is pro is going to have to remove her. I just I don't see it going on this way. And I think Jack Smith is playing his cards uh, to to have that be um, the end. Um, and ironically, it's a tough one because that is the most clear cut case against Trump. Uh, as I said last week, he's got he had the documents. They were classified. He refused to um, to give them up and they had to raid his place to get them. That's that's it. That's all you need. Right. I mean, there's more to the obstruction all, uh, and all of that. But th that that's the most clear cut of the four prosecutions so far. And, um, and, and you know, if he's if you got a biased judge trying to uh, do what they can to, to to somehow undermine that. And I, I don't know what she can do, continue to do other than, you know, criticize Jack Smith for y using the wrong grand jury. Um Anyway, uh, the, you know these these are going to have consequences, and these are going to be discussed and in the story for a long time. What do the Republicans do about it? I don't know. So it's funny you went that path because I because I'm interested in hearing your feedback. Um, Asa Hutchinson, he's on the record. He said over the weekend, I think, that the Florida case that you just described is is open and shut, um, like yeah. dead on arrival. Any defense because of the nature of the claims. Uh, involved that that's his position um and he said that under the circumstances you know it, it makes sense for trump to actually you know uh, step down and not not actually be the candidate which we know is not right. going to happen we know that's not going to yeah. happen he's so, running to stay out of jail according to some people so yeah so 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 there are some people that that you know on the debate stage like you said but i'm curious here so this is the question i'm curious what your thoughts are real briefly i know we just have a couple minutes here um for mike pence is there is there a like like is there a lane where Chris Christie says, see, uh, look at the indictments, look at the convictions, look at the where things are going. We need a different person. And that impacts people enough to to, you know, do a refresh, a reboot. And, and then just because he was already the vice president, it might be easier for people to 
some people like a uh what's the word a marginally necessary set of folks like is, is there a lead for him at all to hang around i, I mean it's I, I think it's possible but i just don't see how he wins i don't think may see mega people turning out for the guy they wanted to hang i mean you know for being a traitor he's he is the biggest judas to them and so yeah. uh, you know he'll i think he'll tag along with the six percent maybe he could get as high as 15 percent. maybe he could be the dark horse horse appointee if they maneuver but i just don't see how he has a chance he will not get the return out um needed to defeat biden so uh, that might be the concession i gotta talk a little bit about hawaii I've often been on the phone with the governor coming up here and the senators. And uh, and let, let me say, address that devastating wildfires, some of which are still burning in Hawaii. They've claimed the lives of 99 people so far, and they haven't cleaned things up yet. The deadliest wildfire in more than 100 years. A whole city destroyed. Generations of native Hawaiian history turned into ruin. I've spoken to Governor Josh Green multiple times and reassured him the state will have everything it needs from the federal government. I immediately approved the governor's request for expedited major disaster declaration. That's a fancy word of saying whatever you need, you're going to get. And that'll get aid into the hands of people who desperately need it, who have lost their loved ones, who have lost their homes, their livelihoods, who have been damaged and destroyed. All right. Um, we, you know, had a horrific fire in 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 Maui. Um, it it um, it it went unchecked unchecked for some time. Uh, I believe over a hundred are reported dead. I think some are still missing. I immense destruction, um, and the, it's it somehow managed to become a political issue. Well, of course, anything bad happens, you want to attack the incumbent, especially in an election season. And unfortunately for Joe Biden, he first uh, was asked about it and said no comment. That's come across as callous. And then he got to Hawaii and what not just the right wing media, but the national media is covering is his remarks about, oh, yeah, we had a house fire. I almost lost my wife, my my car and my cat. Um, and that was seen as as similar to his comparing his loss of his son to the losses of people in Afghanistan, uh, minimizing out of touch and the rest. But a lot what what the media is missing, and I and you know, I don't generally attack the broad media on this, is he also uh, when he appeared at a meeting agreed to meet with individuals. He stayed there for a very long time, talking to each individual he could about their cir circumstances. And a lot of them were quite grateful for it. Um, there were within days uh, at least a thousand federal people on the ground. Uh, hard to get a lot more. It's an island that's you know two thirds of the ocean away. Right, Pacific Ocean. So it's just it's um so it, it's hard to get people there. But you know when they say, well, it's slow. And of course, if you're suffering uh, and you've lost your house and you don't know where your relatives are and the rest, anything is going to seem inadequate. It just is. But that's the the microphones that the media are pushing their faces into it. Not other people who are actually quite grateful for what FEMA and some of the other departments have done. But it's turned into, uh, you know, a, 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 on this two-year anniversary of the withdrawal from Afghanistan is uh, showing that Biden is incapable of, you know, organizing a, a, a good effort here, no matter what they're, what they're doing. And um, you know, I don't know what a president is supposed to do about that. But the, unfortunately for him, it's fueled by the no comment and the other comments that they can cherry pick and focus on. Um, while there isn't a lot of coverage of really what's going on on the ground, uh, both from state and federal uh, authorities, and it seems like they're doing the best they could, and certainly uh, seems to be designed to evade any discussion of whether or not these fires would have taken place but for climate change. Yeah, no, I think you raised a bunch of really interesting points and, and it is a tragedy and it is hard for people so close to, you know, the, the time when it happens. It's the deadliest American wildfire in 100 years. Uh, over 100 people died and even the most recent number I saw, um, it, at one point it was about 1,300 people were considered missing. Now it's down to like 850. So apparently, hopefully a lot of these folks have just evacuated and they've been 
getting re you know reconnected with their people um so that that's there's some degree of silver lining that is you know some significant yes. amount of people uh, turned up so to speak um but i think there's two there's two really critical things here one is that um there's a there was a well, three really. One is that there's a, a huge schism right now between, say, left and right. So everything is viewed through these prisms. If you're mm -hmm. not happy with any government response, you're going to have a negative, you know, your first inclination is to how what what did the government do wrong you know what did the what did the right. Biden administration do wrong but beyond that some people actually have legit complaints so one of the one of the uh, early analysis that I saw said that in fact um, it may have been a mismanaged emergency the public warning signs were not used now there's a reason why they're not used because they're supposed to be there for tsunamis there's 80 on the island of Maui they've had them for decades they use them to tell people to get away from the coast so that's mm -hmm. a very very good reason not to use it, but but the person who tried, kind of went out in public and, and tried to the emergency manager who tried to defend himself on that or or his institution, um, it was not where really well received because of some of these other complaints. So he's was, the one who resigned, right? Yeah, he resigned. Yes. Yep, he yeah. was defending. And it, and it was that state or federal? He was um, local. He was state. Local yeah. state. He was, yeah. he was the he was the emergency manager. Yeah. Um, so yeah. people said there was, you know, overall public voices are saying that um, water was withheld uh, by the government there. So so the firefighting crews left the scene before the fire was fully extinguished. Um, residents were not allowed to return to their homes as a, just sort of a general safety precaution. So they were trying to do their own um, disaster relief recovery efforts on their for their own families and neighborhoods. And they felt that the government was intervening. So these criticisms, whether they're valid or or just emotive, these are these are the actual criticisms. So in this climate where where government was su suspect about how you know how that what their overall response was um, now now I want to step into this third piece of it, which is presidential politics, which is Joe Biden, and which is like, how how is that actually playing out? Like you said, um, a lot of, you know, thousands of people did end up going there. Millions of dollars d were deployed. Um, the FEMA manager did say that they were going to, you know, even spend next year's money if necessary. Biden, while he was there, um, you said he met with families. One of the other things that he did was he said, look, we'll be here for as long as it takes to rebuild Maui the way the people of Maui want it to be rebuilt. These are the saying the right things. He went there. These are doing the right things for the most part. But what are we seeing in the media instead? What we're seeing is the criticism for not doing, not going there soon enough. Um, by by, you know, federal, I guess, decree, you can hand out seven hundred dollars to every person involved. That was something that could be done immediately, but immediately it was published, uh, you know, publicized as, look, you know, the entire city burned to the ground as if it was an incinerator, and they're sending people a check for seven hundred dollars, which doesn't even pay for a hotel room, or you know, so so in a way that they like. The fact that not quite enough, it felt like not quite enough was done, was used as t as a as a tar you know weapon. And and there's there's others, um, other other petty criticisms we could talk about. But yeah. I just I'm curious. I, I mean, there's there's a real big one is that there was a blockade on. I'm I'm probably going to mispronounce this. The Hanoa Palani Highway at the south end of Lahaina that was blockaded. They would they didn't want people going on the roads. I don't know what the rationale for that was, but apparently the people who defied the blockade drove around it, found ways to get around it, survived at a bit, much higher rate than the people who. who who complied with it. Um, and uh, that's a big controversy. Again, nothing to do with a federal response, but it's all going to be thrown at Biden no matter what, um, you know, no matter how, how far. And yeah, there's probably, you know, there, there are, are um, uh, there's there probably aid is a little bit slow to going in. I don't know what happened with the water there exactly. And I, I imagine investigations will have to ha happen with that. But there are people on the ground. I mean, now thousands of uh, federal people on, on, on the ground now and, um, and, and the aid is getting to them and they're clearing stuff away. Uh, Army Corps of Engineers is clearing away the, the more toxic stuff. And you know, they're probably going to start rebuilding within a matter of days. But it's again, if you're going through it, it may seem inadequate. You know, Hawaii feels like it's left out of a lot of stuff, and maybe there should have been more resources available there to begin with for something like this. But again, this kind of thing doesn't happen. Yeah, and and I think too, you know, le legitimate um, reflection on a disaster response 
uh, and I don't even mean to like bias how that sounds by saying legitimate. I just mean thoughtful revisiting the the disaster response and finding flaws. That we're going to need to do more of that because, like you said, um, with climate impact, climate change, we're seeing hotter, drier. Oh, you know, it's it's catastrophic all over the world. The like continents all over the world, we're seeing things like this happening. I think four four countries right now are on. You know, just look right to the east of us and to the north. Um, air quality is some of the worst air quality on the planet because of the the dense smoke coming out of these forest fires. So people people are suffering here, even in our own backyard, over these impacts. But I I think it's important to to just kind of circle back to our topic here, our sesh, our uh, you know the segment is yeah. the politics of it because it. I do want to mention just how petty it all seems when when you know Biden is in a meeting and um, he appears to some people to be drowsy. He appears to other people to just kind of be comfortable. I don't know body language reading 101, whatever. But but the reinforcing the sleepy Joe narrative, the fact that that is the drumbeat that we're hearing instead of you know how do we improve the lives of the people of Maui? How do we improve disaster response? What can we do? Um, what can be done to kind of try to transit expedite the transition away from fossil fuels these things that could really help um instead we're saying oh biden you have no empathy and you have no perspective because in your speech you talked about your own kitchen fire you had to talk about yourself instead of talking about the people who you were sure. trying to pay tribute to so yeah maybe there's a stylistic you know hit he could take for for maybe that's not the slickest or or most comforting yeah. and, and it's also situation. cherry picked out of a long speech i mean yeah you know, so it's just you know they, if you're looking for something and you want to take it out of context and isolation that will define the speech you could do there could be another 20 minutes of conversation that is you know much more appropriate and people who were there may not even remember that comment when they come out and wondering why it's such a big deal and I have to do it, you know, I have to say, because I just I find it um, a little disconcerting that this is where our discourse goes, um, yeah. because there's another one. There was another one, which is um, claims were made over an inappropriate conversation President Biden had with one of the rescue dog handlers. I don't know if you yeah. saw this, no. but he, he came in and there was a rescue dog, you know, like uh, uh, helping find bodies in the rubble, and et cetera. And, and he put his hand down for the dog to sniff and he said, hey, buddy, you know, like I like dogs and whatever. And he was talking to the dog handler, just just a human moment. And and people like he was very heavily criticized in conservative media. Like, what are you doing? You're talking to the dog like what? This is a really important yeah. this is a really important meeting and you're hanging out talking to the dog. And, and I just think that that's just so petty. Um, it is. It, but but that's what it's that's unfortunately it's like a, in our trench warfare politics um, we we kind of lose sight of the forest for the trees and anything we could do to tear down um, people that we consider our opponents uh, and granted I mean people could say politics have always been that way like Mar you know Madison and and Jefferson back in the day like whatever like people always tore each other down I get it but the truth is that um, you know it's just not helpful and um, and it and it just and we're getting worse. You're hearing more right. and more people saying, like, I don't know if we're going to still have a country after more, you know, more years of this. Of course, we're still going to have a country. But the question is, like, what what is preventing us from figuring out a way to focus on what's important, like the people of Maui and dealing with improving the preventing this in the future? But we have to talk about, you know, dog handlers and kitchen fires. Yeah, I mean, I suppose some of the right wingers will say that um, that it's tit for tat. You know, Trump was um, was attacked for throwing paper towels. Um, it, it looks silly, but maybe it was out of context too. You know, with with that and and um, the the. Um, that and in fact, Democrats are bringing it up now, saying, "Well, maybe Biden should have been tossing rolls of paper towels. Maybe that would have satisfied Fox News." I mean, and that that is how silly the discussion is getting. Um, and um, but yeah, it, it's just where it's at. I, you know, it's not like and people are like saying, "Well, maybe Maui will remember this in November 2024." The fact of the matter is. The majority of Maui is going to vote for Biden in 2024. It's not it's not even a question.
question. They don't care what Fox News is saying about it. And, you know, and yeah, there are going to be a few people, a couple of famous surfers and the rest that, that raised this. But uh, they're, in 2024, Hawaii is going to be solidly blue. They know that. It's a play for everybody else. I mean, heck, half of some, something like 20 percent of MAGA people don't even believe Hawaii is part of the country. So, it, you know, it's kind of interesting. Maybe they're learning that right now. Um, so it's just um, it, it, but it but it is really uh, a, um, a a sad uh, take on where we are, and it is kind of uh, I mean I don't want to fault social media, but it it, it is because kind of, that's what gets spread around. Everybody is going to know those few things he said, or the or the pictures of him petting the dog. You know, it doesn't matter that he shook hands with hundreds of people literally um, and talked with them for as long as they wanted to talk. Um, that's not going to be covered. And, and even quite frankly, the mainstream media, um, you know, that, that they, they know that people want, or, or at least their, their readers aren't looking for those stories. They're, they're looking for the meat. Um, and, um, and, and, you know, they either want to hear about this speech or hear uh, Democrats talking about how it's petty. You know, I mean, it's just, um, they want, they want conflict and, um, and that, and so that's what the media looks for in these things. And um, anyway, we, you know, it's just, it's a, um, it's a real sad take that this is politicized. It used to be, even, you know, there have always been um, partisanship. We've had really bad partisanship, but it used to be that events like this, people would at least hold off for a week or two before saying it. I mean, I mean, like even with uh, Jimmy Carter, when the attempted um, rescue failed, uh, of um, of the uh, Iranian, the hostages in Iran, um, and planes crashed and soldiers died. Okay, ultimately, D Carter took a hit for that. Um, but nobody said, it, the only person who actually said anything about it was the can independent candidate at the time, Anderson. Um, and he was criticized for saying, you got to wait at least a few days. The country has to be unified at first. There's no concept of a unified country right now of, of you know, hey, we're all unified in the horror of this. Let's get some money out there, uh, ra raise some money to, uh, to, to help these people. Right away, it's you got to attack. Yeah, and again, I know that we just have we're, we're closing up here, but uh, I think we're going to see people like like Governor DeSantis, who's used to dealing with hurricanes, and Governor Christie, who's used to, who had to deal with Superstorm Sandy. Both of them uh, worked very closely with the federal government um, yeah. in disaster relief, and they understand what it takes. And it, there's a there's an opportunity if Maui does come up for them to be um, you know uh, healers to a certain extent, um, and and point out how their own experience uh, informs what needs to happen, what a true leader does during uh, during a right. And, and let's disaster. remember, Christie took a lot of flack for shaking hands with Obama a few weeks yep. before the election. You know, he shouldn't have done that. And it's like, you know, being a statesman sometimes is more important than, poli than um, partisan politics. They just don't get that. Eeny, meeny, chili, beeny, the spirits are about to speak. Are they friendly spirits? Friendly? Just listen. This takes us to predictions. Dave, what do you have for us? I'll try to keep it short today, uh, unusually so. Uh, so um, tonight, uh, it's, you know, for our purposes, it's like right now, this uh, GOP debate is going on, the primary debate. And uh, so what do we expect to see? And I, my prediction is that there are going to be personalities that shine, like Ramaswamy, who really does hit it off uh, with, with the public, and to a certain extent also um, Scott. Uh, but we're, we're so we're going to separate the wheat from the chafe here a little bit. You're going to see um, other candidates who just appear sort of not ready for prime time, like Nikki Haley and and some others, just not just not quite presidential in stature. Um, and in that in that climate, I think um, you know for the for the next uh, you know the the to frame and get ready for the next debate, we'll see that um, it's really going to come down to. Uh, maybe like three three key people that we're really going to be following: DeSantis, Scott, Ramaswamy. I think they're the ones that will get the most press for the next month. 
like I'm going to make a prediction about a drinking game. Uh, there, there's a drinking game that people are doing to take a shot every time the word woke gets mentioned. Um, I'd probably be under the table right away. But um, but th the predictions have been that it will be over 40 some people. I'm predicting it's actually going to be closer to 20 because as we discussed on a previous show, some of the Republicans have realized that there's a point of diminishing returns on woke, including DeSantis. Um, and they are probably going to try to move away from that label uh, and focus on other issues such as inflation, the Maui fire, um, and whatever else that they can attack Biden on. Um, and uh, and of course, you know, the three candidates are going to go after Trump somewhat. And um, But I predict it will be closer to 20 and not over 40 times that Woke gets mentioned. So <laughs> I will count them and report back next week. We'll play along at home. If uh, anybody watching this, you got to record it and play along. All right. Until next time, stay informed and stay engaged.